Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. Apologies to everyone for the delays in bringing you Bundist Political Awareness Part 2. Donna Newman, the emissary of solidarity of the Bundist movement, has been sick with a massive stomach bug. I myself have also been busy trying to put out the information to various media outlets that I could find concerning the recent detention and torture of Abraham Weisfeld, Ph.D., the chairman of the revolution of the Bundist movement. Now, this what I bring you to is a video that came out on August, on August 17th of 2014 by a YouTuber uh, calling herself Marie Countryman. I don't know if Marie Countryman is uh, her real name or not, but that's the name of that's the name this YouTuber uh, promotes herself as. On August uh, 17th of 2014, uh, she put out a video. The exact politics of the YouTuber, the exact politics of the YouTuber Marie uh, Countryman, are unknown, and her politics are 100% irrelevant. Two things should be known about this video. This video, uh, this is a video with Bernie Sanders in uh, the townhouse uh, meeting. Uh, this is not unknown. This is perfect public information. Uh, Secular Talk had expressed disappointment on the stance Bernie Sanders gives in this uh, video. Uh, we're not big fans of Secular Talk, but they can be very reasonable on certain issues. I would say secular talk is progressive, um, in fairness to their program. But they did nonetheless uh, object to the stance you see Bernie Sanders take in this film. Now the highest objective of this video is to express what our actual position on Bernie Sanders is, what our actual position concerning Bernie Sanders is collectively, which is a bit different from Chairman Dr. Abraham Weisfeld. His stance is different from the rest of ours. However, we have come to a broader understanding of what we're going to do concerning Bernie Sanders, as well as Ilhan Omar and any other progressives in Congress, and how we deal with that. And at the very end of this video, I'm going to turn this over to a video from Jason Unruh from Maoist Rebel News, which is something that was never going to be done again. However, the one press that did cover this was, unsurprisingly, Jason Unruh. I tried to get this out to other people, but only Jason Unruh seems to care about what happened to Dr. Abram Weisfeld. And this does say a lot about who are who our actual allies and comrades might in fact be. It may come to the position where, outside of the uh, Bundist movement, among all the Gentiles of the world, it might just be the fact that our allies are going to be the Marxist-Leninists, the Marxist-Leninist Maoists, and the Maoist Third Worldists. And that shouldn't be very surprising. There will be, of course, Trotskyists who align with us, and there will be anarchists that align with us. Um, and maybe to some extent even centrist progressives, but given the way the struggle has been promoted, and the struggle was not really promoted very well by Trotskyists, who often bicker amongst themselves and don't have a unified line, and anarchists who have their origins largely in anti-Semitism, although there are several anarchists who did move away from this, Anarchists tend not to stick around when we actually need the help. And that is not meant to be a sectarian statement. And it is ironic that of all groups, why the Marxist-Leninists are the ones who are most, most interested in what we are doing. But I think that there's just three words that I have to say to put that in perspective. Black Panther Party. And if that just went over your head, then I don't even know if you're worthy of this video. As I had stated before, I'm not above, I'm, I'm not going to pull a Glenn Beck and 
stay, I'm not going to talk down to you. I I'm going to talk down on the audience if I think the audience is ignorant. Because I don't hate the audience, but people who listen to this often have their um, ill-educated objections. We in the Bundist movement do not have time for a libertarian, anything-goes sort of march. In order for direct democracy to be presented, the people have to be educated for it. And for education to be brought forth correctly, the truth must prevail. So, this would explain how the subject of who our revolutionary allies are always turning out to be Marxist-Leninists and Marxist-Leninist Maoists, and heck, even Maoists, they're worldists, as they perceive us more as world revolutionaries as opposed to first worldists. You know, it, it does make sense that we would have more allies coming from them than we would from Trotskyists or anarchists. And again, three words, Black Panther Party. And that should explain everything. Now, I just went on a tangent, but I, 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 provi I decided that I had to do this. I, I talked to Donna Newman before I did this, but she has not been able to finish the second, um, the second uh, film coming from... Uh, she hasn't been, sorry, <laughs> she hasn't been um, available for Bundist Political Awareness Part 2. Uh, we did start it, so to speak, but we, we haven't put it together yet because she's had the stomach uh, bug. So so anyway, getting, getting back on track, uh, the exact politics of the YouTuber Mary Countryman are unknown, and her politics are 100% irrelevant. Now, there are two things that should be known about this video. The first is that Sanders discredits himself with a position on Hamas that he takes. And I say that as somebody who was very critical of Hamas in the beginning, but I noticed when Hamas made certain improvements. Although I, I have to say, I do not agree with Hamas recognizing the state of Israel. And one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get deep into the federation solution that has been proposed. What we as Bundists think that we need to do concerning that and what Dr. Weisfeld's proposal is and how important it might be. Particularly to any United Nations Assembly that is sincere about solving the crisis in the land of Canaan. That being the Holy Land. So, but anyway, and I keep getting off track, but I cannot stress enough the importance uh, that this should not be in misinterpreted, the many various things that are being presented. And I, I have kind of a script in front of me, but it's 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 vague, and I kept it vague because I, I'm very tired right now. So the two things that should be known about this video is that the first is that Sanders discredits himself on, the, on a, his given position on Hamas and how he deflects the subject by bringing up ISIL. This, the, the second thing to be noted here is that at the town meeting, he is being, of course, ambushed. And a bit unfairly, those questioning him should wait for his answer before giving a rebuttal. Although I agree largely with the rebuttals that are given. And I think we all do in the Bundist movement. But they should have at least let him finish his statement and then give the rebuttals. And there's no disagreement with the rebuttals. But letting him finish his statement should be allowed. So again, this video was put out by YouTuber Mary, uh, M Maria C Countryman on August 17th, 2014. Clinics to serve the people who are there. Israel blockades, besieges, and bombs the stateless people who are cut off from the world and we in the United States reward them with their with arms and dollars. And the Senate voted its support with Resolution 498 in the midst of this massacre just a few weeks ago. This resolution condemns only Hamas, but it says nothing about what Israel is doing. A thousand civilians have died in Gaza. Three civilians have died in Israel in sending this money to Israel and replenishing their weapons supply at the same time that they're continuing to bomb hospitals, schools, homes, and UN shelters for people whose homes have been destroyed, what are we saying? Are we saying that a thousand Palestinian lives are worth far less than three Israeli lives? 
Bernie, because you did not vote to support Resolution 498, I, you along with 18 other senators, I see that as somewhat of a positive move. However, are you going to go further? And I would really, I also think this is to be linked to the economic issues that you're talking about with $30 billion going to Israel over the next 10 years. So, thank you. Thank you for your question. And let me repeat. I very much dislike people disrupting meetings. You ask the big question, it's a reasonable question, it is an important issue, I'm going to answer it. And that's what we have to do. I, as a police officer, and it bothers me that police officers have to be there. They have a lot of work to do. And in Vermont, we should not have to have that. So I feel strongly about people disrupting meetings. But you've asked the question. Like, let me do this. Probably the best thing. I sent out a letter. We got a number of uh, people raising exactly the same concerns you did. So if you'll forgive me, let me read the letter. Is that all right? Excuse I've read me. your letter, but go ahead. Right, here. We've all read your letter. We've all read your letter. Yeah, we'd like Have to read your letter. Have you all read? All right. Oh, oh, many, many of you. Right, let me just talk to you. Because I think, I'm sorry, your first name is? Kathy. Kathy raises some very important issues. Number one, has Israel, or anybody in this room, happy or feel good about the kind of civilian death that we've seen in Gaza? The answer is no. Has Israel overreacted? Have they bombed UN facilities? The answer is yes. That is terribly, terribly wrong in my mind. On the other hand, and there is another hand on this issue, you have a situation where Hamas is sending missiles into Israel. Look back. And you know where some of those missiles are coming from? They're coming from population, populated areas. That's a fact. <clears throat> Hamas has used money that came into Gaza for construction purposes, and God knows they need roads and all the things that they need, and used some of that money to build these very sophisticated tunnels into Israel for military purposes. Okay, well, one second. Yes, no, I don't want to be interrupted. The question was asked. It's a bad question. And the I'm the trying to... The okay, Israel has a right to look, exist. If you don't... Yes, they did. You know, is, I, excuse me. Again. Shut up. You, you don't have the microphone. You've you asked... Have. You know, I don't want police officers here. You're going to arrest people? No, I'm not going to arrest you people. But are you going to allow us... Are advice. you going to allow us to have a discussion? Well, what do you think? You come down here. You come there. Come down to be Democratic. Occupied yes. population right. right to resist. All right. You're entitled to your view. You've asked the question, I'm answering it. Let this it is finish. called democracy. Let him finish. All right. All right. I am answering a question, and I do not want to be disturbed and disrupted. All right. You're not the only person. Kathy asked. asked a reasonable question, and I'm trying to answer it. And I don't want to be disrupted. All right? In my view, you're entitled to your view. I am entitled to my view. In my view, Hamas has done those things. And on top of that, Hamas is very clear. They want, their view is that Israel should not have a right to exist. That's the fact. Bullshit! All right. Okay. You know what? It's not a dirty word! Okay. You know, it's not just a terrorist group, it's a service organization. All right, further on, okay. like okay. Israel. Can I finish my remarks? Let me finish. Fine. And the Tell answer is, you know, if you can't come to a meeting and ask the question, then please, don't come to me. All right, furthermore, oh. the is issue of Gaza is not the only issue right now in that region. As some of you may have noticed, there's a group called ISIS. You know what ISIS is? Yeah. ISIS is a, excuse me. ISIS is a group receiving money from around the world that wants to convert parts of Iraq and Syria into a 7th century caliphate. You know what women's rights are in that area? They're below, excuse me, the name Tar. They are, if nobody wants to listen, they can read. Right, right. So you have a situation right now where we are figuring out in that region 
how you deal with people who have tens of thousands of very armed and aggressive people who may be making significant gains in that area. So the point that I'm making is, you know, I share your concerns about Israeli overreaction. I was not one of the people who signed on to that resolution. But the issue is broad. I believe in a two-state solution. I would hope that the United States, in a very, very difficult situation where the leadership on both sides is not particularly good, can finally work out a situation where Israel has the right to exist in security. At the same time, the Palestinians have a state of their own. And that's what I would like to see. Okay? I've been working on it for the last 50 years. I'm sorry, I don't have the magic answer. This is a very depressing and difficult issue. This has gone on for 60 bloody years. Year after year, war walked up. If you're asking me, do I have a magical solution? I don't. And you know what? I doubt very much that you do. Okay, that is my answer. Some of you, I hear that some of you don't like it. You have better ideas? That's great. Let me get some more questions here, please. Bernie Sanders wants to cling to utopian two-state solutions, then this works to discredit him. And it is also true that the crowd is a bit unfair in not letting Sanders finish his statements. Yet, the state of Israel truly never had a right to exist. The state of Israel is based upon the ideology of Zionism, and the state of Israel is founded, it is founded upon concept of dismantling Torah culture, thus exposing it as, as basically completely anti-Jewish. Yes, the State of Israel actually exposes itself as 100% anti-Jewish. And it is also very important that we object to all attempts to legislate gun control in any way, because the this the truth of the matter is is Bernie Sanders is a gun control guy, and this is becoming frustrating. Dealing with the reality in the United States of America by the police being the number one murderers who kill people with guns, um, and that no one is trying to disarm the police officers or the United States military. There is no rational way to justify gun control in the United States of America. So, not not to mention the March for Our Lives kids, that, that does seem to be a psyop by most of us here in the Bundist movement. We, we don't buy into that. And we consistently see the complaints of the black working class who are the biggest objectors, like the biggest amount of people who object to gun control are typically people in the black working class who feel threatened by the police and white racists. And gun control will disarm any sense of revolution. We are not advocating for violence, but we just don't see how peaceful revolution is anything but utopia. Historically, it has never been anything but that. We also know, though, that violent revolution has less bloodshed than peaceful revolution. This has been re proven repeatedly. In peaceful revolution, Innoc you know, the innocent get clamped down by the state in genuine revolution. And sadly, I have to be very careful about words because free speech is fine if you're a white supremacist. But if you're a Jewish, anti-Zionist, socialist, well, free speech doesn't exist for you for the most part. Or it does, but to a fine line if you just don't tilter off. As everyone who puts strikes on our videos does it for hateful reasons. And we know this because we got the death threats before we were forced to take down Liberation Struggle Part 1 and Part 2. But it is very it is very important that we object to all attempts to legislate gun control. Bernie Sanders supports gun control. And that is Hannah Toff's largest concern, by the way. Hannah Toff is our councilwoman of strategic projects. Donna Newman, for some time, had considered backing a half-hearted campaign for Bernie Sanders as a way of pumping up the Bundes movement in uh, to bring us popularity. I, I never fully understood this scheme. 
and because this really would give no real support to Bernie Sanders, so it never made sense to me, honestly. Now, the five council members, that being Isaiah P. Kometstein, um, the councilman of committees, Miriam Emmisberg, the councilwoman of education, Hannah Tuff, the councilwoman of strategic projects, Marvin Eliyahu, the councilman of world forums, and Uri Adia, the councilman of national affairs. They have all uh, wanted to make clear that they objected to backing Bernie Sanders or anybody in Congress, for that matter, because it gives credibility to a system that we would like to see dismantled, that being the Republic, otherwise known as the United States of America. And then you have Dr. Abram Weisfeld, who wanted us to have a campaign completely backing Bernie Sanders 100%, with some reservations I, from what I understand of what he said. Now, it is the right of the chairman to make those suggestions, um, as the chairman is supposed to try to keep us in the most legal position we can be. And we wish to remain legal and not be criminalized, obviously. But the material reality of Arizona um, does not really sit well in most of our eyes with the idea of electoral politics. And um, it puts me in the very uncomfortable position to talk about it, honestly, but I'm just going to do it anyway, and I said I would do it. Um, my grievance to everyone else in the Bundist movement is that we haven't come up with a real creative solution for what our political drive forward will be. But then again, I I think that that should be coupled with the criticism that, in my mind, we are not working fast enough on finishing the manifesto. Of course, at the same time, I'm willing to redact that complaint simply because that writing this manifesto would take a long time. And, you know, well, not a long time, but it, it, it takes time to do so correctly. And, and not make mistakes. I mean, I would say that we're two-thirds finished with it now. But anyway, here are the headlines from Democracy Now! Today's headlines from Democracy Now! Uh, Amy Goodman speaking, and I, I provide them as an endorsement to Democracy Now! And it, it just will cover topics that I don't know if I have enough information right now to cover. So I bring you now to the headlines of Democracy Now! Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Trump issued the second veto of his presidency Tuesday, blocking a congressional effort to end U.S. support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen, which has killed thousands of civilians and sparked the world's worst humanitarian crisis. The War Powers Resolution was passed by the House earlier this month, following its passage in the Senate last month, with seven Republicans joining Democrats. It was the first time Congress has invoked the War Powers Act of 1973 to end a U.S. president's unilateral decision to wage war abroad. Congressmember Ro Khanna, who brought the bill before the House, said in a statement, the Yemen War Powers Resolution was a bipartisan, bicameral effort and supported by some of the president's most trusted Republican allies. This resolution, nonetheless, was a major win. It sends a clear signal to the Saudis that they need to lift their blockade and allow humanitarian assistance into Yemen if they care about their relationship with Congress. It will also call caution this and future administrations from going to war without first seeking authorization from Congress, Khanna said. Bernie Sanders, who led the effort to pass the resolution in the Senate, said via Twitter he was disappointed but not surprised by the veto, adding, the people of Yemen desperately need humanitarian help, not more bombs, Sanders said. Attorney General William Barr issued an order Tuesday that could keep thousands of asylum seekers locked up indefinitely. 
The order, a reversal of existing policy, would affect asylum seekers who enter the country in between legal ports of entry by barring immigration judges from granting bonds for their release. Asylum seekers who enter the U.S. at official ports of entry are already unable to be released on bond. The order is set to go into effect in 90 days. Omar Jadwad of the ACLU's Immigrants' Rights Project said in a statement, this is the Trump administration's latest assault on people fleeing persecution and seeking refuge in the United States. Our Constitution does not allow the government to lock up asylum seekers without basic due process. We'll see the administration in court, he said. In more immigration news, the Trump administration's resuming its so-called Remain in Mexico policy after an appeals court stayed a lower court ruling that had blocked the controversial practice. The policy forces asylum seekers to wait in Mexico while their cases make their way through U.S. courts, which legal experts and rights groups say is illegal. Over 1,100 migrants who entered the United States via the southern border have been sent back to Mexico to wait out their court cases since the policy started. Democrats are seeking information from Acting Homeland Security Secretary Kevin McAleenan after reports emerged last week that Trump told McAleenan he would pardon him if he was put in jail for directing border agents to block entry to asylum seekers, which is illegal. Trump reportedly had the exchange with McAleenan during a visit to the border in Calexico, California, when he was the Customs and Border Protection Commissioner, just two days before Trump promoted him to fill the post, left the vacant by ousted DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. The House Judiciary Committee is also seeking documents related to a March 21st meeting between Trump and Nielsen about reinstating Trump's zero-tolerance family separation policy and shutting down the U.S.-Mexico border. The deadline to respond to the committee's request is April 30th. In London, climate activists from the group Extinction Rebellion continued their campaign Tuesday, blocking major roads and bridges and bringing traffic to a standstill. Demonstrators are demanding the government commit to a zero-carbon economy by 2025. Police arrested over 200 people in London. We'll have more with two of the activists who participated in the London protests after headlines. Extinction Rebellion co-founder Claire Farrell and international environmental lawyer Fahana Yamin, who was one of the people arrested. Back in the U.S., Extinction Rebellion activists took aim at the Republican Party protesting in front of the Republican National—the um, uh, RNC headquarters in Washington, D.C. Capitol Police arrested or reported eight members of the group as they occupied city streets. Demonstrators called on passersby to support their actions and take a stand against fossil fuel-funded politicians. The RNC has been called the biggest criminal enterprise in the history of our species. They are the center of climate denial, so we're out here today as part of the International Extinction Rebellion to let the RNC know that we know what they're doing, we're going to continue to call attention to their denial, to how they're ruining our planet. More actions across the U.S., the U.K., and other parts of the world are expected in the coming days. Parisians held a vigil Tuesday night as France continues to mourn the burning of the famed Notre Dame Cathedral. The fire destroyed the cathedral's spire and its wooden roof, but rescue efforts succeeded in preserving some of the more than 850-year-old cathedral's most treasured relics, including the crown of thorns and the tunic of St. Louis. French President Emmanuel Macron vowed to rebuild Notre Dame, Notre Dame within five years, as donations for the reconstruction effort reached nearly $1 billion. Paris's prosecutor said the investigation into the cause of the fire, believed to be an accident, will be long and complex. Authorities say they won't know the full extent of the damage to the cathedral until it's cleared as safe for inspectors. In Sudan, ousted President Omar al-Bashir has been moved to a maximum security prison. Al-Bashir was overthrown last week following a months-long popular uprising calling for his resignation. The African Union warned Sudan's Transitional Military Council Tuesday they have 15 days to install a civilian government or face possible removal from the African Union. Protesters have been staging a massive sit-in in the capital Khartoum, demanding civilian rule.
In Egypt, lawmakers approved new constitutional amendments Tuesday that would allow President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to remain in power until 2030. He's currently scheduled to leave the post in 2022, at the end of his second and current term. The amendments will now be put to a referendum. Critics warn the changes will only increase Sisi in the military's authoritarian reach. Sisi's crackdown on dissent has led to the detention of tens of thousands of people since he came into power in 2014. Last year, Human Rights Watch reported a Around 15,000 civilians, including hundreds of children, have been referred to military prosecutors. In news from Indonesia, early results show President Joko Widodo, known as Jokowi, has been reelected, defeating former Special Forces military commander General Prabowo Subianto by about 10 percentage points. Prabowo is the former son-in-law of Indonesia's longtime dictator Suharto. Investigative journalist Alan Nairn recently revealed Prabowo had made plans to stage mass arrests of political opponents and his current allies if he won. Visit democracynow.org to see our recent interview with Alan Nairn on the election. In Libya, the humanitarian crisis is growing as fighting continues to escalate around the capital, Tripoli. The U.N. says more than 18,000 people have been displaced in the past two weeks. The U.N. is attempting to relocate jailed refugees and migrants, but they warn some 3,000 locked-up migrants are now trapped in or around the combat zone. On Tuesday, at least four people were killed during heavy shelling on the southern outskirts of Tripoli, according to local reports. Libya's deputy prime minister said Tuesday that renegade general Khalifa Haftar, who is leading the eastern-based Libyan National Army's offensive on Tripoli, is attempting to stage a military coup. We'll have more on this story later in the broadcast. In Israel, a court ruled Tuesday an investigator for Human Rights Watch must leave Israel by May 1st. Omar Shakir is the Israel and Palestine director for Human Rights Watch. The Israeli government revoked his work visa last year under a law that bars entry to foreigners who call for boycotts of Israel or Israeli settlements. In a state Human Rights Watch denied Shakir or Human Rights Watch have ever called for boycotts of Israel, adding, the decision sends the chilling message that those who criticize the involvement of businesses in serious abuses in Israeli settlements risk being barred from Israel and the Israeli-occupied West Bank, unquote. Human Rights Watch says it will appeal the deportation order to the Israeli Supreme Court. Digital freedom advocates are calling for the release of Swedish programmer and data privacy activist Ola Bini, who's been detained in Ecuador since last Thursday. His arrest came hours after WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was dragged by British police from the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Bini is accused of hacking government computers in Ecuador. Prosecutors in Ecuador said they plan to charge Bini with plotting to blackmail Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno. Critics say Bini is being targeted because of his close relationship relationship with WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. This is Bini's lawyer, Carlos Saraya. What Ola Bini does is encrypt information so that, as a matter of fact, hackers, as you like to call them, do not have access to information and cannot steal it. He does exactly the opposite of what he is being accused of. In Colorado, schools across 20 districts in the Denver area are closed today. As authorities hunt for a woman they say is infatuated with the Columbine massacre and travel to Monday on and travel to Denver on Monday, 18-year-old Sol Pice reportedly bought a gun and ammunition after arriving in Denver and made threats that the FBI say are credible but not specific. Denver area schools, including Columbine High School, increased security Tuesday after the news broke. The 20th anniversary of the mass shooting at Columbine High, in which two students killed 12 fellow students and one teacher, is this Saturday. A woman is suing controversial Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz for defamation in relation to an ongoing sexual abuse case involving his client, billionaire sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Virginia Jufri, who alleges Epstein sexually abused and trafficked her in the early 2000s, starting when she was 16 years old, says Dershowitz participated in the sex trafficking and accuses him of later falsely claiming she fabricated the accusations and that he had never met her.
The lawsuit filed in the Southern District of New York Tuesday brings to light an affidavit by Maria Farmer, a former employee of Epstein's, who says she frequently witnessed school-age girls coming to Epstein's New York City mansion and that, on a number of occasions, Dershowitz would go upstairs with the underage girls. Farmer also revealed she and her sister were also assaulted by Epstein, as well as his alleged madam, Ghislaine Maxwell. She was 26 at the time of the alleged assaults in 1996, and her sister just 15. Dershowitz, who is also a close friend of Epstein's, helped him secure a plea deal after he was arrested in 2006 for sexually abusing dozens of underage girls in Florida. Dershowitz has denied the charges against him himself. In New Jersey, Rutgers University faculty and union members are celebrating after reaching a tentative agreement with the school's administration, avoiding what would have been the first strike in Rutgers' 253-year history. Under the new contract, teaching assistants will see a pay raise, gender pay gaps, as well as pay gaps between different campuses will be closed, non-tenure lecturers will also be granted contracts of up to seven years. The school's administration also agreed to guarantee a workplace free of sexual and online harassment, the tentative contract will now be voted on by union members. Residents of Papua are mourning the death of West Papuan peace advocate Nellis Tabai, who died Sunday at the age of 55 after a battle with cancer. Tabai was the coordinator of the Papua Peace Network, a Catholic priest who covered human rights stories and military conflict in the region for the Jakarta Post and other outlets. He was credited with helping establish a dialogue between the Indonesian government and West Papuans, who have been seeking independence since the 1960s. Tens of thousands have been killed by Indonesian security forces since the 1990s. In 2017, Indonesian President Joko Widodo appointed Tabai as an advisor on Indonesia's relationship with West Papua. Nellis Tabai continued to tirelessly campaign for peace, even as his cancer progressed in recent years. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. The recent arrest, detention and torture of Abraham Weisfeld, Ph.D., was brutal, and we provided a, some statement that was initially written by Dr. Abraham Weisfeld himself. We had some difficulty putting it up there because the texting um, in the blog proved difficult, but we did get it up there. Um, you'll, there's also a spot for the statement on the website officially. But yeah, the, the recent arrest and detention uh, and torture of Dr. Abram Weisfeld. Um, there's a statement on it now. And to give somewhat of a really good understanding of it, we are going to turn now to uh, Jason the Maoist Rebel. As nobody seemed to be listening to this, and we were trying to get press coverage for this, we got no press coverage for this. I went to several media outlets, some of which I was sending donations to before, and I have dropped donating them. Yes, there are patrons that I'm no longer paying into as a result of them not paying attention. Um, however, there was one man who listened. His name is Jason Unruh. That's right. Nobody listened except for Jason the Maoist Rebel. This report from Jason Unruh of Maoist Rebel News was published on April 15th, 2019. I want to tell you a story about a man who stood up for what he believed in. And as a result, he was tortured by the Israeli government for about a day and a half. His name is Dr. Abraham Weisfield. Now, he's a Canadian citizen. Now, he has shown solidarity with Palestinians against the Zionist regime that is inside Israel. 
Uh, he went over there in an act of solidarity and marched with some Palestinian people on land that was about to be stolen by Israel. It's a new, it's a new, it was a new settlement under production. Now this ended up causing him to be tortured by Zionist soldiers in the Jordan Valley of Palestine. Now he came to to walk through Israel's new colony, the settlement of Ma'el Ephraim, close to the Jordanian border. I've probably butchered that name, but that's the place. Now while they were walking, they were approached by a a uh, a group of soldiers, and turned out to be. What happened was going on was that there was a major military maneuver that day. They eventually came down and began to speak to them. Essentially what happened was this doctor ended up becoming trapped. He was abducted by Zionist forces and essentially tortured. A total of eight people were detained while leaving the end point of the walk. Five were Palestinians of which Dr. Weisfield was one. One Palestinian woman, Gadir Abuzina, remained imprisoned for the six days following the incident. How did all of this get started? Because the previous Friday they went out to plant an olive tree on the hillside of Bedouin village in El Hama, in the territory being sought for annexation to Israel. My words cannot do justice for what this man went through. I cannot tell his story as well as he can. To the link in the description, uh, the link in the description will give you the official statement that he and his organization made about what happened to him. This, the footage that you just watched was provided by a member from his organization who, well, they gave it to me so that I could tell his story. And one of the points that the doctor wanted to make was that he, as a Jewish man, was treated in this manner by a state that claimed to represent Jews. That he was essentially tortured for simply disagreeing with the Zionist occupation. So I encourage you to learn more about this incident and what this man went through. Please go to the links in the description. One of them go to an official statement. Another link will go to his YouTube channel. And I think this is a story that needs to get out there. And the world does need to know about how this man was tortured by Israel for simply planting an olive tree. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.